Bonjour and welcome back to our course, World History Before 1500. My name is Philippe Girard. In the first lecture of this course, I gave you a general idea of where world history fits in the grand scheme of things. I won't go over every aspect again, but remember this, history only covers the very end of the evolutionary time scale. The universe began almost 14 billion years ago. Hominids, humans, go back three or four million years ago in East Africa. Homo sapiens, our species of humans, we emerged around 200,000 years ago, again, in East Africa, before spreading out worldwide. And historians like me only cover a tiny sliver of that, the period after the invention of writing, which took place 5,000 years ago, 3,000 BC. Today we'll discuss what changed when humans went through an event as momentous as the appearance of writing, as well as another revolution, which would be the invention of farming, the Neolithic Revolution. Before we get to those topics, though, I would like to define a term, civilization, that we will use a lot in the class, whether we speak of the Aztec or the Sumerian civilization. That's a kind of term, civilization, that we use a lot, like race or culture, without properly defining it. So what does it mean exactly? Etymology, a uh, study of where words come from, uh, that's always a good place to start. The word civilization, in that case, comes from the Latin word, kiwis, which means the city. So a civilization would simply be a group of people who live in a city. For most of the history of Homo sapiens, our ancestors were hunters, gatherers. They chased big game, they picked berries and mushrooms, and so forth. And that lifestyle is not very efficient. There's only so much time you can spend in a given spot before you've scared away every animal and eaten all the berries. A few weeks or months, you need to pack up and leave somewhere else wherever the game is. So hunter gatherers are nomadic by definition. Nomadic simply means that they keep moving all the time, as opposed to a sedentary person, sedentary, uh, who lives in a single spot year-round. So prehistoric hunter gatherers were few in numbers because their way of getting food was inefficient. If you have too many hunters in a given spot, simply not enough game for everyone. So the early Homo sapiens lived in small groups of a dozen people or so. They moved around constantly, and each group was separated from the other by vast distances. Uh, this means that for most of human history, there were very few human beings around. You can get a sense of this by looking at this graph, which depicts the size of the world population over a very long scale. What you immediately notice is how much the world population has boomed since the age of discovery in the 1500s, and especially since the industrial age in the 1800s. And there are reasons for this, such as the Columbian exchange and the invention of vaccination and modern medicine, uh, which I cover in the second half of this course. But if you look closely, there is also a small bump around 10,000 BC. That would correspond to the end of nomadic lifestyles and the Neolithic revolution. So what is this Neolithic revolution? Uh, well, in a nutshell, it means a time roughly around 10,000 years ago, 8,000 BC, more or less, when humans mastered agriculture and animal husbandry, i.e. when humans switched from being hunter-gatherers to farmers and cattle herders, which also meant that they stopped being nomadic and became sedentary, which, because obviously once you plant a crop, uh, you've got to stick around long enough uh, to do the harvest. Most of the civilization we're going to study in the course, with the exception of the Mongols, uh, will be sedentary rather than nomadic. So pause the video for a second and ask yourself, what would have changed to your world if you had switched from hunting and gathering, you know, nomadic lifestyle, to farming and animal husbandry in a given spot? A lot of stuff, not much. Think about that for a sec. Well, at first, the impact of the Neolithic Revolution may not have been that dramatic. Uh, after all, a grain-based diet is not as rich as a meat-based diet. Also, people live together in one place instead of small roving bands all over the place. Uh, they get into contact a lot, and contagious diseases become an issue. So the death rate uh, might have gone up as well. And it took a while for the population of farmers to increase. But overall, in the long run, the Neolithic Revolution was the beginning of a process that took us from a worldwide population of maybe, I don't know, a million people worldwide before the Neolithic Revolution to maybe 200 million people worldwide by the time of uh, Christ to 1 billion by 1800 and almost 8 billion people today. None of that would have been possible without farming, 
think for a second what would have happened if all the people in a big city like New York City had to live off hunting. I don't know, even pigeons or rats or whatever lives in the subway in Manhattan. Not going to happen. But there's more to the Neolithic Revolution than just a demographic boom. After all, when we speak of a revolution, we mean that there's a profound political and social reordering of society. So what began to change when people settled in one spot and population density went up? Well, for one thing, the concept of private property, the very basis of modern capitalism, came into being. If you have a lot of people in a given area and you just spent a lot of time planting a field of crops, then you definitely want to put a fence around your field and a sign that says, mine. And the ownership of land would have made no sense to people before that who lived in a low density area. We'll get back to that issue when we talk about the pre-colonial sub-Saharan Africa later in the class because there was a low density of population there. Consequence number two of the Neolithic revolution, as farming became more efficient, humans were able to produce a surplus of food. So instead of everyone being involved in farming, or hunting before that, uh, you can have a situation where 10 or 20% of the population does something else, like being a priest, or a leader, or a warrior, or a craftsman, okay, even a teacher. And so humanity invented social classes. And those non-farming people, like myself, typically they don't live in the countryside. Instead, uh, they would congregate in cities, which is where we get the term civilization, people who live in cities. Places like Sata Huyuk in present-day Turkey, or Jericho in Israel, or Ur in Iraq, some of the earlier cities in the world. If people spend all their time mastering a single craft, like, I don't know, teaching, they may become very good at it. Especially if they live together in a city, they have access to writing, they can exchange the discoveries with their neighbors, and they can record those discoveries for future generations. So the invention of farming around 10,000 years ago and then writing about 5,000 years ago uh, had yet another consequence. It was followed by a surge in knowledge that was quite remarkable. From the time when hominids first appeared on the world stage to the Neolithic revolution, a span of three or four million years, humans invented pretty little fire, stone tools, and that's about it. In the 10,000 years that followed, which is just a blip in the grand scheme of things, we went from the Stone Age, Neolithic, to the Space Age. Writing, at first, that was purely utilitarian. You may have had a symbol for the number 10, as well as a symbol for a cow, and you use that to recall that this farm produced 10 cows in a given year, which is useful for accounting and tax collecting, but not much else. But then symbols appeared for concepts other than tangible things, instead for abstract stuff. A cow could also be a not-so-nice reference to a woman who is not physically attractive. And soon you have enough symbols to discuss some high-level concepts like religion or philosophy, or you can create fictional worlds, epics, poetry, and you just invented myth and literature. In fact, language gives us a hint that civilization is not just about hunter-gatherers becoming farmers and then city dwellers. Uh, and then growing in numbers, but also about the acquisition and diffusion of knowledge. Uh, when you say that someone is quote-unquote civilized, you mean that this person has culture and manners and that this person is smart, right? And being uncivilized is very pejorative by contrast. If a person is not civilized, that person is a barbarian. And a little digression about that term, barbarian. Uh, this comes to us from one of these early civilizations, the Greeks, who thought that the people who lived outside the realm of Greek culture were brutish idiots who spoke some unintelligible tongue, something that sounded like ba 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 to a Greek ear. Hence the term barbarian, someone who lives outside the city, outside the Greek polis, the city, and so likes the kind of refinement that is associated with civilization. There's another association between civilization and culture. When you speak of uh, civilization like, say, the Greeks, we're not talking about a specific city or kingdom, because the Greeks, uh, for much of their history, were divided between rival city-states uh, that fought one another. Uh, when we speak of Greek civilization, we speak of a group of people, especially city dwellers, who share the same culture, the same language, the same gods, uh, the same values. So civilization is also a culture. And these cultural markers are key when historians try to explain what defines specific civilization. 
Now let's switch to geography for a second. If you look at the map of these early civilizations, you'll notice that many of them were located alongside rivers. The Tigris and the Euphrates for the civilization of ancient Iraq, or the Nile in the case of Egypt, or the Tiber for the Romans. And that was also true of civilization in India and China, which we'll not cover in the class for lack of time, uh, but where civilization also rose and fell in ancient times alongside the banks of the Indus River and the Yellow River. So take another pause in the video and ask yourself, why rivers? Well, the most obvious answer would be water. Huh? Uh, that would be crucial for farming and irrigation, especially in places like Egypt that are notoriously dry. And trade would be next. Until the advent of railroads, uh, transporting goods on land was incredibly expensive. So it made sense to locate trading centers like cities uh, next to a body of water, whether it's a sea or a river. Remember that a consequence of the Neolithic Revolution was the creation of a surplus and the emergence of a class of artisans. So now you had items to trade, whether it's pottery or grain or, or salt for the Romans. So trade, another foundational aspect of modern capitalism, that appeared during that era as a consequence of the Neolithic Revolution. So there you have it. A civilization revolves around a city located in a strategic location like a river crossing where traders and craftsmen and other social classes who share a similar culture congregate so that they can produce and exchange valuable goods. Doesn't that sound tempting, especially if you're outside that city and you have a sword in your hand? Well, you guessed it. Another consequence of the rise of the cities was war. And surely cavemen must have gotten to an argument every now and then and then hit each other in the head with a club but war definitely became more central to human experience once cities emerged as choke points uh, for trade. Uh, simply put, the prices were much richer. The first recorded battle in all of human history around 1500 BC was about a city, Megiddo, which is located in present-day Israel. We know about it because the Egyptians won the battle and the pharaoh was so proud about it that he got an account inscribed on the walls of a temple in Egypt. And a little digression here, according to devout Christian and Muslim, the hill of Megiddo, Armageddon as it's called, that's also a place where a great battle will be fought during the end times, the apocalypse. So if this is correct, and we're dealing with prophecy here, not history. Megiddo would be the place where both the first and the last battle in recorded history were and will be fought. Another issue that city dwellers had to tackle was who was in charge. Small groups of hunter-gatherers never had to give it much thought. All they needed was one person, maybe smarter, maybe stronger, maybe older, who would serve as a leader of the group. But the situation becomes trickier when you have a city of several thousand people, divided into social classes, dominating a surrounding countryside, and connected by trade, war, and diplomacy with other cities. So you need to decide who will govern that city and how. What are the rules? How do you select this ruler? And revealingly, a polis, P-O-L-I-S, the Greek term for a city, that's also the root of the term politics, and the art of governing the city. So should you be ruled by a single king, a class of priests, an aristocracy of merchants, a ruler who claims to be a god, or God forbid, the people? Uh, we'll get back to all these issues when we study ancient Athens. Also, if you have different social classes, are all people equal? Or do you have nobles and commoners, patricians and plebeians, masters and slaves? Uh, we'll get back to those issues when we study the late Roman Republic. So there you have it. The Neolithic Revolution around 10,000 years ago and the invention of writing around 5,000 years ago caused a profound shift in human experience. Cities appeared as well as culture, literature, trade, war, a population boom, social classes, politics, uh, the web of developments that we historians describe as the dawn of civilization. All right, the class so far has been about fairly general stuff, the passage of time over in eons in the first lecture, and then what happened uh, in general terms after the invention of farming and writing, which is that second lecture that I'm doing right now. So it's time for us to move to more specifics. Next time we begin section one of the course, which will study the ancient times, i.e. antiquity, which simply means a long time ago, ancient stuff. And this is a period that begins with well, history, obviously, the invention of writing around 3000 BC, 
and ends, at least for Europe, uh, with the fall of the Roman Empire in the West in 476 AD, so roughly 3,500 years. Along the way, we'll study the most notable civilization of the Middle East and the Mediterranean, uh, Egypt, Greece, Persia, Carthage, Rome. Uh, but first on that list will be Mesopotamia, which is today Iraq, where civilization began. And we'll see that next time. Thank you. Au revoir.